Abiraterone is an orally available steroidal uh, inhibitor of the CYP17 enzyme complex. Uh, in, in inhibiting CYP17, it reduces androgen production. Uh, and in many patients who take it, uh, in fact, most patients who take it, uh, androgen levels can go down to near zero or undetectable levels. Now, um, the, uh, the mechanism of action in, in, in inhibiting CYP17 leaves open the potential for stimulation of the adrenal gland in the parts of the adrenal gland that are not inhibited by CYP17, most importantly being the mineralocorticoid pathway. So the side effects of abiraterone basically come from that uh, mechanism. Uh, aldosterone excess or an aldosterone excess syndrome is the clinical uh, output of that, and that can lead to fluid retention, potassium loss, uh, and some of the consequences are the sequelae of fluid retention, such as congestive heart failure, peripheral edema, and those types of things. About 7 to 10 percent of patients may experience a transaminase of elevation uh, as a consequence of abiraterone therapy, uh, and, uh, and, and in doing so would likely have to discontinue the drug or decrease the dose. The drug is indicated uh, currently in, uh, in, with FDA approval in two uh, settings in metastatic castration-resistant prostate cancer in patients who have already received docetaxel and have experienced disease progression after docetaxel. It's also indicated in patients who are asymptomatic or minimally symptomatic, uh, but chemotherapy naive uh, and have metastatic castration-resistant prostate cancer. And more recently, it's, uh, it has found great use in the setting of metastatic hormone-sensitive disease based on a large uh, series of studies done uh, in uh, Europe and Canada, which showed a significant survival benefit when abiraterone was added to initial androgen deprivation therapy. Enzalutamide is currently FDA approved for men with metastatic castration-resistant prostate cancer. So those men who clearly have tumors on imaging studies and the tumors are no longer responding to castration therapies like LHRH or GNRH agonists or antagonists. So enzalutamide is approved in a space where multiple drugs are approved, such as abiraterone, chemotherapy drugs, radium, and cipolucyl T. Enzalutamide is an androgen receptor antagonist. It makes it so that the testosterone or any androgen cannot bind to the androgen receptor. It also blocks the movement of the androgen receptor into the nucleus and the binding of that receptor to DNA. So it has a threefold effect. Enzalutamide has some risks associated with it. In early studies, particularly the phase one and phase two study, there were seizures at higher doses of enzalutamide. So currently we use 160 milligrams a day and at 360, 480, and 600 milligrams, people had seizures. And also in the phase three study, post-chemotherapy, there were some people with seizures, particularly those who had had risks for seizure, seizures. Um, and in the phase three study, pre-chemotherapy, there was one seizure in the enzalutamide arm, one seizure in the placebo arm. So we're getting better, I think, at selecting patients who are appropriate for this agent. And the other risks are uh, fatigue. So the fatigue can be quite profound, and it can be a reason to decrease the dose. Hypertension, so it's important to follow up with doctors and get regular blood pressure checks. Um, cognitive dysfunction, so the thinking is just a little bit cloudier than it used to be. Um, so if I have a patient who's a high-performing patient, you know, an economist, a, a writer, I may not use this drug right away out of concern that it might cause thinking disorders. And then in patients 75 years and older, it is associated with falls. Enzalutamide and abiraterone have some cross resistance, which means a patient whose cancer is resistant to the abiraterone could already have resistance to enzalutamide, even though the patient hasn't tried that medication. So both of these drugs work through the androgen receptor. The enzalutamide blocks that receptor and the abiraterone decreases the circulating androgens that can bind to that receptor. If that receptor mutates so that it doesn't bind to testosterone or enzalutamide anymore, then either one of them can be defective. And I think Dr. Antonarakis at Hopkins initially showed that the ARV7 is very important in this mechanism. One of the things with all of these drugs, be it abiraterone, enzalutamide, apalutamide, or darolutamide, 
is cross resistance, meaning patients clearly respond beautifully to these drugs, but eventually most patients stop responding to these drugs, and that's been the big challenge in not just prostate cancer, but all the ma major cancers is how do we avoid that resistance? One of the things we can say about apalutamide in some of the earlier phase one and phase two trials, they looked at patients who had stopped responding to abiraterone. Certainly abiraterone is a, uh, a CYP17 inhibitor. It's also used to treat advanced prostate cancer in this space but it has a different mechanism of action than apalutamide or enzalutamide. And they looked at these patients who had already stopped responding to abiraterone and compared response of apalutamide versus enzalutamide and seemed to suggest that patients on apalutamide might have had a better longer-term response to patients who had stopped responding to abiraterone. So while enzalutamide and uh, apalutamide are similar, there may be some subtle differences that allow some patients to continue to respond to one versus the other. Enzalutamide and apalutamide are both novel oral antiandrogens. They are both much more potent and effective as, a po as compared to the previous generation drugs such as flutamide, nilutamide, and bicalutamide. Having said that, they're also very similar in the sense that they're very potent. They result in significant disease response over some of the previous generation oral antiandrogens. Both enzalutamide and apalutamide do appear to cross the blood-brain barrier. And, but, on, but both of them appear to be very safe. Apalutamide so far has not been associated with any seizures, and the fall risk with apalutamide, with my take on the literature, being a little bit less than that was seen with enzalutamide. The other concern with these drugs, both apalutamide and enzalutamide, is there is a risk of fatigue. And if we look at trials from both both of these uh, phase three trials, anywhere from 30 to 70 percent of patients will report some fatigue. Most patients, it's manageable and they do not have to discontinue the drug, but in, in the practical sense, managing fatigue is one of the biggest challenges of this class of drugs. At Duke, where I work, for example, we have some, uh, some trials going on where we're combining these drugs with a formal exercise program and to try to determine if we can help manage fatigue in these patients by putting them on a formal exercise program. There's also some studies ongoing with diet to see if what we can do to try to improve fatigue levels in patients who are on these life-saving drugs.